Welcome to Stock Options, a deep dive on proposed solutions to stop insider trading in Congress. I'm Trevor Potter, president and founder of Campaign Legal Center, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Ten years ago, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act, or the Stock Act, was passed to address public concerns about controversies involving the stock trades of members of Congress. Since that time, the controversies persist, and polling shows that most Americans, regardless of political affiliation, support banning lawmakers from trading individual stocks altogether. Part of the push for reform of the Stock Act is that despite numerous allegations of violations of the law, including insider trading allegations that arose during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, no member of Congress has ever been prosecuted under the Stock Act. As momentum builds to reform congressional stock trading, one question is how can we ensure that current proposals don't produce another inadequate policy that allows violators to go unpunished. Today, as we discuss this question, our panel of experts will take a deep dive into the various proposals that have been put forth, review the merits of these solutions, and examine potential loopholes. On the CLC website, you will also find a summary of our blog series, The Stock Act, the failed effort to stop insider trading in Congress. That offers a review of how we got here and what we can do better moving forward. A link is also available in the comment section on the platform you are joining us on today. With that said, I would again like to welcome you to this discussion and turn it over to our moderator for today, Deirdre Walsh, who will introduce the members of today's panel. Deirdre. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Deirdre Walsh. I'm the congressional editor at National Public Radio, uh, also working as a correspondent reporting on stories. Um, I've covered the Stock Act since it was passed. Um, and uh, before I was at NPR, I was at CNN covering ethics issues on, on the Hill, including some of the early issues with the Stock Act. Um, I feel like we're at really kind of a pivotal moment um, with the policy and also the politics around the law. So um, I'm really excited to be moderating this panel. The members of this panel have really helped me get smart on the issue over the last few years. Um, so I'm going to introduce them in a minute. Um, just one housekeeping thing before I start. We're going to start with a Q&A of the panel. I'll take the first round of questions and get the conversation going with our panelists. Um, and then we'll move to a Q&A from our virtual audience. Um, we're happy that you all are joining us on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Um, when you want to ask a question, if you could put the question in the comments section, uh, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can in the time allowed. Um, we may not be able to get to all of them. Hopefully we'll answer the topics of the questions that people are interested in during our time. If we're unable to get to your question, I'm going to ask you to submit it uh, by email to the Campaign Legal Center because we'll, they'll be a great resource for everyone on this issue. And the email for that would be info at campaignlegalcenter.org. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's panel. Uh, I'm going to start with Ambassador Norm Eisen. Uh, Norm is a senior fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution, and he's an expert in ethics law, um, anti-corruption law. Before this, he was an ambassador to the Czech Republic, and he worked as special counsel and special assistant to the president for ethics and government reform during the Obama administration. Welcome, Norm. Uh, Lisa Gilbert is joining us today. She is the executive vice president of Public Citizen 
Previously, she was the deputy director and then director of Public Citizens Congress Watch. She advocates for government transparency and integrity. She works on financial reform, civil justice and consumer protection issues. And I believe Lisa was around when they wrote the original Stock Act. So she's an expert on sort of how we got from uh, there to here. Uh, now we have um, our next panelist, Donna Nagy. She is the C. Bun, uh, ben Dutton Professor of Business Law at Indiana University's Bloomington Moore School of Law. She specializes in securities law and insider trading. She's testified before Congress in 2011 during the original Stock Act discussions. And in 2020, she authored uh, an opinion piece with Richard Painter, Painter um, urging House and Senate leaders to, uh, to adopt some reforms to the Stock Act. So that uh, that debate has picked up over time, obviously. Um, our last panelist is Kedrick Payne. He is the Campaign Legal Center's Vice President, General Counsel, and Senior Director of Ethics. Uh, Kedrick specializes in government ethics, lobbying law, and election laws. Previously, he worked as an investigator uh, on the committee, uh, the Office of Government Ethics. He investigated insider trading and other ethics violations. He was the Deputy Chief Counsel at the OCE. Um, thanks to all the members of the panelists today. Um, we're going to just jump in. I think the place to start maybe is where we started with the Stock Act. Um, I was there when the sort of earlier scandals or um, questions about a, a conflicts of interest were, were arising on Capitol Hill. So I'm going to start with Lisa. If you can just sort of take us back to that time and talk about what got us started on the need for Congress to address the issue of the need for oversight and transparency for members of Congress to disclose their stock trades. Great. Well, thank you so much for that question. And then before I jump in, I also just want to say thanks to the Campaign Legal Center for the invitation to be here today. Uh, as you said, Public Citizen has been focused on these issues over the long term. So I, I do appreciate beginning with the history question, as we were very engaged in the fight for the original Stock Act of 2012. Um, I'll start by saying the issues of congressional insider trading really did not have a lot of momentum when the Stock Act legislation was first introduced. It was rep Brian Baird's bill in 2011. Uh, Public Citizen, led by Craig Holman, our government affairs lobbyist, was pushing for the Stock Act. Uh, the bill had only nine co-sponsors in the House for the better part of a year, and there was no bill in the Senate. Uh, even a truly stunning academic study that came out showing that senators enjoy a 12% higher rate of return on the stock market than the rest of us was not enough to get the bill moving. Uh, so it really changed the story, changed the game, um, and gained the bill almost instant popularity was a 60-minute segment on congressional insider trading in 2012. Uh, it aired a shocking expose, which really infuriated the public and mobilized support for the legislation. Um, the number of co-sponsors exploded from nine to 177 in just a few days. I had never seen anything like it, and the numbers continued to grow afterwards. Uh, and after that, legislation was introduced in the Senate from Republican Senator Scott Brown and Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillibrand right away. Uh, the bill was sort of quickly gaining steam, uh, rolling down a hill, if you will. But then uh, Representative Spencer Baucus, who is at that point chair of the House Financial Services Committee and was a big focal point of the 60 Minutes documentary, uh, made sort of one final effort to try to derail the momentum uh, by claiming that the law against insider trading already applied to Congress. And so you know, new legislation wasn't necessary. Uh, he brought in Robert Kuzami, who was director of the SEC enforcement at that point, to testify. Uh, and Kazami clarified that the SEC had literally never applied the insider trading law against members of Congress. Um, so that testimony completely derailed Bacchus's last ditch effort, uh, and even he ended up signing onto the bill. Uh, you know, it officially passed the Senate 96 uh, to 3. The only no votes were Senators Bingaman, Coburn, and Richard Burr, um, which is ironic based on more current scandals, uh, and later passed the House 417 to 2. Uh, it was a huge step forward, and I know we're going to talk today about how we need to approve upon it, but we should remember that the bill itself, uh, you know, provided for disclosure of stock transactions, uh, prohibits insider trading, uh, and was a huge step at that point. So I'm excited to, to talk about how we can advance the back of the year, but um, you know, excited to see that brought us to that point as well. Next. Um, Norm, um, you were, I believe, at the, with the Obama administration during this time or during this debate, 
Um, and the Stock Act um, has provisions that apply to the executive branch as well. If you could talk a little bit about um, trying to have some sort of parity between the executive branch and Congress around the um, passage. And that was for me, right, Deirdre? Yes. Um, well, uh, our ex experience in the Obama administration and in the executive branch uh, made us a strong supporters of parity. Of course, as Lisa will remember, uh, uh, then I had an open door policy as ethics czar, and we diplomatically uh, but firmly supported that in the executive branch. And I'll give the example of President Obama. Uh, the executive branch rules um, are extremely strict when it comes to individual stock holdings. Uh, and uh, uh, not that President Obama's finances, which I shared the responsibility for making sure we're conflict free, were complex, but he held no individual stocks whatsoever. Deirdre, I wouldn't even let him refinance his <laughs> bank loans, his mortgage, because of the nature of the presidency. The decision-making process is potentially fraught with conflicts because of the breadth of the portfolio. And that is true, and that is why we have very restrictive rules on what individual stocks can be held, a strong, strong presumption uh, to use widely available and highly diversified mutual funds like most Americans invest in for their retirement, um, and uh, strong recusal rules if you do insist on holding individual stocks. And frankly, in my uh, personnel oversight responsibilities providing ethics perspective, we turned away some nominees who didn't want to or were unable to unload stocks that would have required too many recusals or raised too many questions about their role. So I think it's very important. I mean, we'll talk about some of the specifics, but I think it is very important. And most of the proposals do this to a greater or lesser extent, although the loopholes vary. I think it's very important because Congress is in that same position. These members of Congress are touching every issue and again and again, having stock portfolios, and we saw outrageous examples of this during the pandemic, where they had information about uh, the development uh, and course of the pandemic threat or um, therapies or cures for vaccination or treatment. Um, and uh, we're trading on pharma stocks. I mean, it's incredible. So right. we have to bring Congress into alignment with the executive branch approach. If you wanna serve, the presumption should be with some very narrow exceptions, you're holding uh, uh, diversified, widely traded mutual funds. I wanna bring Professor Nagy in now. Um, if, we, if we go back to the, the example that Lisa gave about the 60 minutes um, sort of thing that put the spotlight on this, that um, report took place uh, detailing some of the investments that members had coming out of the financial crisis. Um, you know, if you could talk a little bit, Donna, about sort of like, you know, how members got entangled in that and, and what issues it brought out in terms of the, the conflict of interest that arises just from them doing their daily jobs, going to briefings. Yeah, so as, as Lisa's um, excellent summary of the Stock Act uh, tells us that um, the aim there was to clear up whatever uh, discrepancy or misunderstanding there would be in terms of whether the federal securities fraud rule um, outlying um, insider trading applied to members of Congress. What the Stock Act didn't take on, um, not for lack of trying um, by some senators and, and others, um, what the Stock Act didn't take on is this question of conflict of interest. Um, 
Uh, the Stock Act made unmistakably clear that if a member of Congress uses material non-public information, government information, to personally profit in his or her securities trading, that violates federal securities law. Um, it, it left aside the question of whether a member of Congress who is motivated by their financial investments to lobby for or obstruct or vote for legislation um, is doing something that is troubling. And in fact, Sherrod Brown and Jeff Merkley, um, as the Senate was debating the Stock Act in winter 2012, introduced an amendment to the Stock Act, which would have required outright divestment of individual stocks. So while we're talking about that now um, in the bills that, that we'll turn to, um, this was an amendment, of course, uh, to the Stock Act. It was given uh, two minutes of debate on each side and the amendment lost. And so the the Stock Act went as a um, prohibition, an unmistakably clear prohibition on insider trading. Um, but here we are, 10 years later, we have increased transparency, which the Stock Act did bring about in terms of the real-time reporting or 45 days after a transaction reporting of individual stock purchases by members of Congress. But we still have not established the type of parity that Norm was referring to with respect to self-interested legislative activity. A member of the executive branch, it's a federal crime right. to participate in a decision that affects one's own personal finances. If one is a member of the executive branch, um, other than elected president or vice president, um, um, federal judges need to recuse themselves um, because there's a federal statute that requires recusal if they have a financial interest in uh, a matter before them. But as of now, unless one of these pending bills uh, makes it into law, we have a, um, a question raised every time a member with a major <clears throat> stock portfolio uh, sponsors or opposes or votes for legislation. Are they acting in their own financial interest or are they acting in the public interest? And the public is left struggling uh, because of the disparity between the three branches. Right. I'm going to move to Kendrick now because we've hit on some of the things that um, that Congress decided to do when it did pass the Stock Act. It didn't pass the amendment banning individual trading. One of the senators who voted for that amendment noted to me recently that they've actually picked up support since that vote 10 years ago. Um, but Kendrick, if you could remind us why Congress decided to, do, to go the route of disclosure and um, why they decided this was the way they were going to try to police themselves in terms of requiring members to rec uh, to file these periodic uh, transaction reports. Yes. So disclosure many times is used as the first lever when you're doing any type of ethics rule. That is, the idea of disclosure is that it will provide the public access and visibility to something. In this case, it was stock, stock trades in a way that the lawmaker would feel some type of shame or feel some type of um, uh, desire not to make the trade because when it becomes public, it just uh, presents questions that they don't want to answer. So the Stock Act became this way to take this first step of providing disclosure. And what we've seen over the past 10 years is that the disclosure showed us, showed us the problem, but it did not resolve the problem. And that's why you have this logical next step with all the proposals that have come out now to try to uh, deal with the potential insider trading, as well as the uh, incessant allegations of conflicts of interest that uh, Donald was just mentioning that are gonna continue to come out as long as you have these uh, uh, reports on stock trades that are released uh, weekly. Let's turn now to talk about some of the, the proposals that are out there. Um, you know, a lot of them have been picking up a lot of co-sponsors in the last few weeks. There's now going to be a hearing in the House Administration Committee next week, next Wednesday, where we will expect to hear some more about the different proposals. There's a group in the Senate that's trying to put together a consensus bill because there's just so many different proposals out there. 
I'm going to start with Donna to talk about sort of the, the different types of approaches that lawmakers are, are mulling over now in terms of going the next step. I mean, we've really gone from disclosure debate, whether or not it works or not, to, um, you know, whether or not members of Congress should just be banned from trading individual stocks. Um. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Doctor. So um, as one would expect with the flurry of bills pending in the Senate and the House, there's probably a, a dozen or so, um, although many uh, are mirror image in the House and the Senate. Um, there's many differences in the proposal. Some are substantial differences and some are more subtle. Um, in my view, the most important difference, the most essential difference, concerns whether the legislation seeks to regulate individual stock ownership by members of Congress or whether the regulation is going to apply only to the trading of individual stocks while a member is serving in Congress. So most of the bills we're going to be talking about in this next hour seek to regulate ownership in addition to trading. And that's because the sponsors of these bills, the ownership bills, <laughs> wish to eliminate or at least reduce the public perception that members of Congress sponsor and vote on legislation that benefits the companies um, in which they own stock. So a ban that restricts the trading of stock while a member holds office is responsive to concerns about the use of government information in securities transaction. And as we've all established, that is clearly illegal. Um, those trading bans to most extents do not tackle the different concern about the self-interested legislative activity as it pertains to stock in a portfolio that was assembled before the member took office or before this legislation. Um, so that's the most essential difference, whether it's ownership that's being regulated or whether it's just the trading while members are in office. The next most important difference concerns the means of regulating the ownership of individual stocks. Um, many of these proposals um, will require individual stocks and many other investments to be held in a qualified blind trust. That's a vehicle that essentially puts an independent third party in control of the investment decisions for the securities in the trust. Um, so there's many bills that that basically go down the qualified blind trust avenue for all um, as securities that are owned or all stock in individual companies that are owned. Several bills, though, don't um, follow this blind trust avenue. Um, there are proposals that instead impose a flat out ban on the ownership of individual stocks. So the legislation introduced by Senators Elizabeth Warren and Steve Daines would be an example of a flat out ban on ownership of individual stocks. So those are the most important differences. Um, but there are other differences that I'll just cover really quickly. Um, I've been talking about individual stock ownership for simplicity state, but one needs to establish or one needs to examine each bill for how precisely the covered investments are defined. Um, every bill I'm aware of uh, doesn't seek to regulate uh, owning or trading of diversified mutual funds and US Treasury bills, for example. But beyond those, there are significant variations in terms of how each bill defines covered investments. The bills are also different in terms of who is covered. Um, right. Every bill regulates members themselves, um, most apply to spouses, some apply to dependent children. The Jeff Merkley uh, ban conflicted trading bill also extends to congressional staffers. Uh, there are also some proposals seeking to regulate others outside of the legislative branch, Supreme Court justices and their securities trading, for example. Um, there are differences in the public reporting, um, enforcement and penalties. Those are just some other examples. I'm going to bring in Lisa now to just talk about where public citizen comes down in terms of which of these proposals, which approach uh, in terms of ownership ban versus trading and who's covered, um, you all think are the most effective public policy. Thanks. Well, 
you know, I should start by saying that a public citizen, we want a final bill that is as comprehensive as we can get. You know, I should say all the proposals currently out there, as Donna was just saying, ban trading activity of individual stocks by members while in office. And that in itself is a huge improvement on the current state of play where members can trade stocks, bonds, commodities, futures uh, with impunity. So we are just happy to be having this discussion about minutia because we do believe that you know any of these policies would be incredibly impactful. Um, we don't believe that the only way to deal with conflicts of interest is an absolute ban on individual stock ownership. Though, of course, we're very supportive of that idea should it be the winner in the final compromise legislation among all the champions of the bills it is uh, probably the most straightforward way to do away with conflicts of interest um, that said you know transferring investments into a widely held and diversified mutual fund or an etf uh, or requiring that members put their funds into qualified blind trusts are both viable options you know widely held funds near the market and so as such, it uh, should be impossible for members to impact their individual investments based on information they get. Um, so that's a really good option. The same should be true of qualified blind trusts, but there are some caveats. Uh, we think a qualified blind trust will only work to eliminate conflicts of interest and insider trading potential if it's truly blind. So in other words, if you, you know, place assets into a trust, uh, the beneficiary you know, has to ensure that, that they don't know what assets the trust holds. The trustee has to sell all the members' individual assets prior uh, that they held prior to joining Congress. There just has to be a complete turnover of the funds residing within the trust for it to be effective. Um, an additional risk with qualified blind trust is that because of the personal disclosure requirements of the Ethics and Government Act, the trust manager does have to do an annual notification to the lawmaker of where his or her assets lie at the end of the year for their personal financial statement, they could share too much. So the trust has to be managed properly. I think that's the bottom line so that the lawmaker doesn't learn information that gives them any insights into the fund. So if done right, a qualified blind trust does solve the problem of lawmakers trading stocks uh, for personal gain based on insider information, but it has to be done right. So I think I should end by saying where I began. You know, we do think that all of these options can work and are a huge improvement on the status quo, um, but they have to be managed uh, effectively to work. I was going to bring in uh, Norm um, because, uh, again, there's this issue of, of, of different standards for different branches of government that comes up uh, in this debate. Um, Speaker Pelosi has mentioned this issue, saying she wants any bill to cover members of the judiciary, including the Supreme Court. Um, Senator Gillibrand has a bill that, um, that the Senate has already um, taken up to do that. Um, where do you where do you think that debate goes? And do you think that if if Congress is going to do this, they should again try to apply the standard across the board? Um, I I do think um, uh, uh, that uh, if there's any ethics regime that makes the stock trading one in Congress look good. It's the Supreme Court. The complete absence of any ethics structure. And you really, it is a self-regulating ethics regime. So it's a, you know, the, the, um, the justices are free essentially to make their own determinations about whether something is a conflict or not, Deirdre. Um, that's insane. And, um, you know, we've recently seen this uh, covered extensively by the New Yorker, who I spoke to also by the New York Times on the allegations about the Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny, deep ties to the January 6th actors in the in and related to the terrible events of those days, that day, and and yet Justice Thomas, uh, not recusing himself, um, uh, in those matters. So there's a, the, I do think the Supreme Court should be covered, but Congress uh, is a bicameral body, and typically we're able to get more traction on the broader remedies in the house there has been resistance on updating the stock act 
uh, that resistance appears to be breaking. And then sometimes these details like covering the Supreme Court can be much, much tougher in the Senate. The Senate does have a tradition of being more deferential. They have more to do with the same Supreme Court, frankly. Uh, and so those members of the House Judiciary Committee who hear Supreme Court uh, nominations, uh, for example, they tend. So we'll see if there's the political will to do it uh, in in the Senate uh, or not. I want to bring in Kedrick because um, you've been tracking a lot of the issues with transparency with the current law. Um, in addition to these proposals to ban individual trading, there's also been some element on the Hill talking about tweaks to the Stock Act and that there would still be some form of the law around. I'm a little confused about that because if you ban members from trading stocks, um, you don't need to file these reports on trading stocks. So if you could, if you could talk a, lo a little bit about what you, um, about how that would work um, and sort of what elements you think um, should go into the next reform. Uh, sure. So uh, with the idea that the Stock Act disclosure requirements would still apply even if you ban members from trading stocks, uh, you have to realize that some people are not covered by these proposals. And, and, and specifically, I'm talking about senior staffers. So senior staffers are covered by the Stock Act, but out of the, there's seven major proposals. Out of those seven proposals, uh, only one includes senior staffers as the uh, of being included with the ban on tr trading stocks. Uh, so the question is whether this new law that updates the Stock Act should really apply to senior staffers, where you continue to have this disclosure law uh, that would only apply to senior staffers and not uh, the members. Uh, keeping in mind also that the Stock Act disclosures also apply to the executive branch. So it, it needs to, uh, if there's ways to strengthen the disclosure for the executive branch, uh, that should continue. And finally, just to answer your point about what would we like to see in there, I, I think that uh, uh, Donna touched on a, a big part, which is we would think that you would know if this law is serious if it comes out and has a ban on or restriction on stock trading as well as stock ownership, because if you're simply able to maintain what you had before you were in Congress, uh, you're still going to get the allegations of a conflict of interest when some official act is taken that could influence that uh, stock uh, that stock asset. And then uh, I will also point out that we would like to see a clear deadline for compliance. You can have the most perfect law uh, on the books of what should happen, but if there's this long runway for the members to comply with it, it is not in effect. Right now, all proposals, uh, well, the majority of the proposals have this six month window for uh, compliance. Others have four, some have three, but then they all, except for one, allow the ethics committee full discretion to continue to extend this uh, uh, um, compliance period, or at least they're not clear on the fact that the ethics committee does not have that authority. One thing we would expect to see is to have, let's say, a four-month period to become uh, compliant, and then this small window of no more than two months that the ethics committee has discretion to add on. That brings you, a good, a good just, point. Can I, um, I just want to follow that one question because I, I hadn't heard about this before. So if, if one of these laws is passed um, and essentially gives the ethics committee the discretion for the transition, there could be a pretty big, like six months, a year. I mean, who knows how long, right? Because the ethics committee is notoriously slow it, to act and, and takes a lot of time to investigate, et cetera. And, we, and that is not a transparent process, right? We don't learn about that in the public. That's right. Okay. Professor Neji, if, if you wanted to weigh in, I'm, I'm, you had a follow-up comment. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the um, congressional staffers issue and sort of bring us back to the differences between illegal insider trading, which is already a crime and already a civil offense and conflicts of interest. Um, because this conflict of interest that we have the, the huge disparity between the legislative branch and the executive and judicial branch. There's a bit of an irony here because um, 
Senate staffers who work for a Senate committee under current Senate rules are prohibited from owning stock in the subject of their committee work. So um, uh, senior Senate staffers on the telecommunication committee, working for the committee, not an individual senator, cannot own telecommunication stocks um, unless they get a specific waiver. And so, but the, but the Senate members of the telecommunication <laughs> stock can have a portfolio of telecommunication companies and um, not only be trading those, but legislating in areas that directly affect Affect that stock portfolio. So in the 1970s, when the Senate amended its rules to prohibit the senior Senate committee staffers from stock ownership, of course, the question was raised, well, why isn't this being extended to the senators themselves? And the answer was twofold. One was the Ethics and Government Act's transparency provisions provides reports um, albeit woefully long, um, uh, lengthy in time, that is. Um, and second, that senators stand for election, um, and so their conflicts are judged by their constituents as opposed to senior staffers. But um, you know, if this wasn't clear in 2012 when we were debating the Stock Act and the Stock Act was passing, it's, it's, it is crystal clear today, 10 years later, that the transparency, as Kendrick said, in some ways just make us, us more aware of the flagrant conflicts of interest in this helpless suspended animation we're all in. Um, and um, the electoral check is one at most that allows the people in a state for a senator or the district for a member of the House to have some type of check. Um, but uh, the rest of us uh, who are affected by these conflicts of interest and don't happen to sit in the district or state have absolutely no say of it. So if, if somehow on a wild hope that in 2012, the Stock Act's transparency provisions was going to shame um, members into self, against self-interested uh, self legislative activity, we see that um, you no know, more needs to be done. Right. That, I mean, this discussion about a transition issue um, who's covered um, brings me to the issue of loopholes, right? Like the compliance issue is a little bit of a loophole now, right? Because members are supposed to file reports. Then they, if they don't file them on time, it's a $200 fine, but like there's no public transparency about who pays a fine. You actually have to chase down a member and ask them to, to publicly admit it. Um, Norm, can you just talk about sort of other loopholes we should be sort of mindful of as we get into this phase of, of, of possibly another bill? Yeah, uh, Deirdre, and we've heard the loopholes alluded to in, 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 in the analysis of Lisa and Donna and Kedrick. Um, you know, there's a set of loopholes around who the covered individuals are going to be. Um, I favor... Uh, of course, I'm a well-known absolutist on these questions, but it worked for us in the Obama administration. And I think everyone from President Obama on down says, you know, it was painful at the time, but it rendered a scandal-free, one of the most, the most scandal-free administration. I think Congress should look at the same thing going forward for this regime. So, Covered individuals is one important loophole. Clearly, we have to have members. We have to have their spouses. Personally, I favor uh, dependent children being included. I think we have to think seriously about senior staff. I recognize the staff retention issues uh, and just the human difficulties if you have a closely held stock or that, that the, you have stock that you've held for a very long time. You feel it's an important part of your retirement plan. You have a limited income. So nevertheless, I would have coverage for senior staff. Um, I there's the just, Can I just interrupt one thing? Like senior staff sometimes have partners or spouses too. I mean, that raises that whole loophole too. 
It does. And that, that is something that needs to be worked through, but you don't necessarily need to have the same regime for um, senior staff as you do for members, because while senior staff are very important to the process, they do not vote on these bills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's okay to have some uh, variation. Uh, accepted investments are another place. What are the investments that are going to be covered? I've already talked about, you know, my view that it should be a narrow aperture. There are challenges, legacy issues. Um, some of the bills do include blind trusts as a vehicle. If you use blind trusts, however, they are notoriously susceptible of ma manipulation, so they need to be truly blind at arm's length. You know, in every one of these scandals we're seeing in Congress, typically the excuse, and sometimes it's legit and sometimes not in these stock trading scandals. I didn't do it. My uh, fiduciary, my broker did it. My wife did it. Uh, my trustee did it. So uh, that's the second area of loopholes, the investments and how they're managed. We've talked about the compliance issues. Um, and that obviously is very critical place where um, uh, there's many a slip twixt the cup and the compliance lip. Um, I think uh, disclosure, I favor that some of the bills have very, very vibrant and speedy sunlight. It does put a burden on members. You know, the downside, the reason that these loopholes, that we have the loopholes now, and the last one is the penalties, should they be severe or mild. The reason that we have compliance delays and milder penalties is because people do make inadvertent mistakes. I know some of these members, I've worked with many of them for years. I was their lawyer during the impeachment and, you know, a number who have been accused of improprieties. I genuinely believe just they were busy. They had family crises. They, things get out of hand. Um, and you can see the mess on my bookcase behind me been meaning to tidy that bookcase. I hope there's not a delayed stock filing on trial <laughs> in one of those papers. Uh, and so, you know, there are, that is the reason that we have uh, some of the loopholes we do to allow for inadvertent error. But nonetheless, across those loopholes, there's a very good CLC paper that addresses them and the different options. Um, across the loopholes, I do think, you know, we live with a much tougher set of rules very successfully for everyone from cabinet members on down, senior staff and far below senior staff levels in the executive branch. And we get along just fine. So Congress can do the same. And, you know, the outrage of the Supreme Court, they certainly should be included. So just a reminder, if the audience has questions, please put them in the comment section. We'll keep going with our panelists' questions, but I'll try to bring in those questions. Um, talk. Of, uh, I want to bring in Kedrick because we talked a little bit about the fine issue and the compliance issues. Um, I'm interested, like, what is the appropriate penalty? Like, what do you think is the right fine? I mean, $200 for somebody who issues a puts in a late report months late that made hundreds of thousands of dollars on trades doesn't seem to be much of an incentive to worry about <laughs> a violation of the stock oh. act um you know what what is your sense about um about enforcement measures in some of these proposals that we're looking at sure i, I think you know, the Stock Act taught us a lot. It taught us, one, through the transparency, what was actually happening with the frequency of trades and the types of trades. And then second, it showed us that if you have a very detailed law, but at the end of the day, the only penalty is $200, you're not going to get a, a, a complete compliance. So I do think that this can be fixed with these proposals that are out there now. But what needs to happen is that the proposal should include very defined uh, in and, and easy to calculate uh, penalties. So the $200 penalty is based on a 1970s law about uh, following financial disclosures, and it was never uh, uh, increased for inflation. So that's, that was a, a big penalty in 1978. Uh, I think that the penalty now for, and keep in mind, this is not failure to file a report. If you violate these restrictions on um, 
stock ownership or stock trading. This is failure to comply with divesting your assets. So the penalty really should be a per day penalty. So how many days are you out of compliance? And it should be a exact figure such that you do not have the discretion for the ethics committees to weigh or to change or to calculate what that may be. What we have to watch out for is, is what you see in some of the proposals now. They have a penalty that looks like it's good, but it's really not something you can calculate. So for example, one uh, proposal says that 10% of the value of the asset uh, should be the penalty. Well, it's a stock that the value of the asset changes daily. How do you calculate what the value of that asset mm -hmm. is? It, 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 it will bring in so much confusion that it, once again, the law just doesn't work. So uh, in a nutshell, it just has to be something that's um, firm, it can be calculated and um, it can be applied equitably across all offenders. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, I think we're going to bring in some audience questions. Um, just waiting for a second to, to get one of those. Um, uh, but you know what? I'm going to start. Oh, here we go. We have a question from Kimberly Leonard. Thanks for uh, for joining us today. Um, Kimberly is a reporter at The Insider. Um, she's asking staffers on committees aren't allowed. Um, I definitely saw a bunch of conflicts like that when reporting on conflicted Congress. Um, I'm not sure if I'm seeing the entire question. But I, I think, I, I, yeah, I think I know what the question is related to what Donna's uh, point was about. There's this rule that people don't even realize. I've seen the rule 37.7 that Senate staffers cannot uh, have significant holdings in committees where uh, they have jurisdiction over that stock. Here's the part, the reason why uh, it's not really, in, we don't know how it's enforced, is that there's no transparency with how the Senate Ethics Committee determines what's a significant holding. Is it one share, two share, what's the value of it? There's also no transparency of whether the Senate committee chair or ranking member uh, provides a waiver. And you also don't have complete transparency with Senate staffers' um, assets because you have to physically go to this hill to pull those uh, documents. Right. Donna, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there, there certainly would be um, a lot of discretion there, as as Kendrick did say. Though I think that um, I think that that most senior staffers in the Senate on committees um, uh, try to adhere to at least the spirit of this. That is, if you're on the telecommunication, uh, telecommunication, if you're a staffer assigned to the telecommunication committee, your stock portfolio, um, should not have AT&T in it. <laughs> and, and if it does, it's a problem. And the stock acts reporting the transparency would, would reveal that if there's trading or, or even ownership of that. Um, that's that's not to say it's perfect, but um, I, I'd say that it would even be a step in the right direction if members of Congress could not own stock in the companies that their committees have jurisdiction over. Um, I, I consider that a, a big win. And so, um, you know, the devil is, is often in the details. Um, it, it takes us in a slightly different direction, but, I, but I'd like to circle back to the blind trust idea, um, just because while I don't think a blind trust is a loophole, I, I do think if that's the route that the Senate or the House bills go down, we really have to give significant thought to the compliance issues involved with monitoring the blindness of a blind trust. Um, we see that there is failure to file reports within the 45 day and members claim they're busy and this is inadvertent and all of that. And um, even accepting those good faith explanations, um, I can't imagine what it would be if, if hundreds of members of Congress all had their individual stops in blind trusts um, to make sure that they are qualified and blind throughout the process of ownership. Um, so, um, well, I, wanted to, I, wanted, I wanted to touch on one very quickly an important point there about compliance and enforcing this, this qualified blind trust. One thing I think the proposal should include 
is liability for the trustee so that the trustee has to think twice before they provide this information mm. to the member. And the way you do that is very simple. An annual certification that they have not given that information about the, uh, the, the identity of the stock or the stock trade signed under the False Statements Act. This is a quick one-liner, 18 U.S.C. 1001. That annual certification signed by the trustee and included in the member's annual financial statement and then there's something that the person will have to think twice about. Nora, yeah, I, to weigh in. I just was going to point out that Kim and her colleagues at Insider did a very good analysis that she alludes to here where they found, I think it was over 180. They looked at a recent one year period, 2020 to 2021, and they found over 180 um, filing issues by senior staff. So while we haven't seen the same kind of headline uh, generating criminal investigations relating to staffers, and I, I don't, uh, you know, based on my own experience there, including service as a staff, I know uh, how hard the staffers work and how much they have to juggle. But I do think those, you know, 180 plus late disclosures point to um, a significant set of compliance issues that need to be contended with as Congress thinks through. But as I say, you can modify. You don't need to have quite the same regime for senior staff that you do, you know, with dependent children. I mean, uh, there, there are regulatory burdens that have, for, that have to be weighed and balanced. So um, that's my intervention. Got it. And Insider has done a, a lot of great reporting uh, around the Stock Act. So I, uh, in addition to Campaign Legal Center, I also should take a look at what they've reported. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. I believe we have another question in the queue. Um, this one comes from Emily McDaniels, who's joining us on Facebook. Um, Emily asks, uh, there have been several bills proposed. Which one do you feel is the most likely to become law? Or do you think it would be responsive to issues with uh, congressional trading? Should we look to solutions that don't require Congress to regulate itself? Excellent question. Uh, I'm going to start with Lisa. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tough question because all of the offices who propose different versions of this legislation are in the midst of a process right now to come to a compromise vehicle. So I imagine the final uh, moving target that we see will be some combination of, of the many bills we're talking about here today. Um, you know, there are perhaps more solutions that talk about the qualified blind trust as, as the mechanism. So, so maybe we're trending that direction if I was to read tea leaves. Um, but I think it's it's hard to know from the outside as they they I'm sure will pick up you know components of, of all of them. Um, certainly, the second part of your question, looking for solutions that uh, require Congress not to self-regulate, are always better. Um, you know, the the less uh, members of Congress and senators have to sort of look inwardly and, and shine a spotlight on themselves, the more likely we are to have successful uh, transparency and understanding on the outside. So uh, yes, I think that should undergird all of our solutions as we think about this. Uh, Norm. And I just would point out that um, uh, all of the bills represent a, an improvement over what we have today. Agreed. I'm heartened that uh, Warren and Danes joined in the Senate on a bipartisan bill, and it's both bipartisan and bicameral, uh, Pramila Jayapal and Matt Rosendale in the House have also co-sponsored. It doesn't mean that that exact piece of legislation is the one that will end up as the vehicle, but it signals it's always a healthy sign when you have bipartisan, bicameral uh, interest in an issue. And I, I applaud all of them and everybody else who's been pushing this legislation. It's about the only thing I've applauded on the part of Senator Hawley in the past uh, 14 months, but uh, he does have a bill as well. Yeah, as you said, there there is bipartisan support for a lot of these proposals. Um, I want to bring Kendrick in because one of the issues dividing some of these proposals is who's covered, which we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, and the issue of spouses. So, you know, do you think it's likely that we'll, be, we'll see Congress um, move forward a proposal that could cover spouses? 
I, I would hope so. And the reason why is I come from this from the perspective of a former compliance lawyer in private practice who would uh, counsel clients on how to comply with the law, but also recognize where there's the gray area. So you can expect these lawmakers who may be required to uh, put things in a blind trust or sell stock will quickly ask the lawyer, so uh, is there anything else I can do? Well, there's no prohibition on you transferring that stock to your spouse or having your spouse uh, purchase additional stock. Same thing with your dependent child. So it's such an obvious loophole and so huge that uh, the first sign that a serious law has really been proposed is if it includes spouses. Okay, let's move to the next question. We just have about five minutes left. Uh, we have Brandon Myers, who I believe is joining us on YouTube, uh, asking uh, some bills allow for deferral of taxation gains on stocks that members would be forced to divest if they move if we move to a, a ban. Could you talk about those? Um, Donna, why don't you start on that one? Sure. Um, so I think that if um, if the legislation doesn't have deferral of the taxation on gains, uh, then I think it. Uh, I think for most members, um, blind trusts are going to be the only alternative um, because most members would not want to have to sell and then pay capital gains on those sales. Um, so I know the Senator Warren and Senator Danes. Um, uh, they their bill does ban the outright ownership of um, uh, of individual stocks and in companies, but that also does include the uh, deferral of taxation of the gains. I think recognizing the reality. Now that is regulated as it is in the executive branch, uh, which which also allows for deferral of ca capital gains. You have to. Um, if you're selling stock for a divestiture reason, um, you need to put the proceeds into a another investment, um, a, a, a qualified investment, and diversified mutual funds would be the um, uh, would be an alternative. Uh, uh, that would provide for the deferral. So for the pieces of legislation that don't include deferral, then I think we're left to the blind trust as the default. Um, Got it. All right, I'm gonna, time is short, so I'm gonna, I think we might have another question in the queue if we can get to that one. Um, this one comes from Stephen Harris. He's asking if one makes it mandatory to eliminate all individual stocks, do you view the tax consequences as a price of that person's uh, being a member of Congress? Is that just sort of the price of, of being um, a public servant? Um, what do you think, Lisa? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, functionally, all of these pieces of legislation start with this question. You know, we are putting restrictions because it is critical that we can trust in government and we trust our elected officials not to be trading on insider information they might be getting in the course of, of doing the people's business. And so absolutely, um, you know, if there, there are many consequences we've talked about here, including penalties for, for doing the wrong thing, and they're all inherently appropriate that they applied, be applied to members. I, I, no one may be able to weigh in on this from the executive branch and the certificate of the vestiture, but I, I think it could work with giving some tax deferral uh, to individuals. And, and so I'm not opposed to that unless Norm can say that from the executive branch, you saw a downside to it. No, quite, quite to the contrary. I think it's, you know, when we can have lawful inducements to ethical behavior mm -hmm. and can remove the unintended consequences, mm -hmm. that's a very important part of a high functioning uh, ethics regime as uh, Lisa and Donna and Kedrick, as you know. Um, part of the reason, although our Obama administration uh, uh, ethics regimen was known for its uh, stringency, but actually we worked very, very hard to give waivers when appropriate, to provide certificates of divestment, to think about how to police and enforce narrow recusals, to deal with spousal employment and financial issues and all the rest of those, um, of those structures that can soften the severity of the of the tough restrictions that all of us are pushing for uh so uh, i'm all for it 
Yeah. And and deferral is not forgiveness. And so the right. tax bill is going to come sometime. It's just not going to come. It's going to come when one sells the mutual funds that one divested into. Um, and, you know, so I so <laughs> uh, tax bill is going to come event eventually. And I think that circles back to just this whole idea of the fondness of ownership of individual stocks, um, mutual funds, a diversified mutual fund, a diversified index fund. For most people are going to produce the same or better returns than a portfolio of individual stocks. And so we really have to step back and ask the question why the passion for individual ownership of individual stocks well i think we're at time um and i'm going to thank all of our panelists um uh thank you norm eisen lisa gilbert donna nagy nagy if i said it right i'm sorry uh kendrick bain from the campaign legal center um i'm deirdre walsh from npr uh during today's discussions we did we did get to a fair amount of questions uh, about the opportunities. There's going to be a hearing next week. There'll be lots of discussion on the bill uh, or potentially the consensus bill that may or may not be emerging um, in the Senate soon. Um, so if you have additional questions that we didn't get to today um, and you'd like more information, I'd invite everyone watching today to email the Campaign Legal Center at info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Thank you again. Thank you for the Campaign Legal Center for sponsoring this event helping me and other uh, reporters I work with um, at, you know, my outlet, other outlets, um, uh, you know, give us the background that we need um, as we uh, cover this story, because it, it, it certainly in an election year seems to be one that's picking up steam. So um, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.